Soil health. This is the topic that everyone in agriculture seems to be talking about. Even the New York Times and presidential candidates are talking about how soil health has the power to reinvigorate rural economic sustainability and to combat environmental challenges from climate change to water pollution. The problem is most people, even those involved in agriculture, don't really know what soil health means. They can describe the rich smell of a healthy soil that brings a smile to their face. They can talk about the dark color and the crumbly structure that's held together by roots that is abounding with pore spaces and tunnels. They can talk about the springy feel under the step and the way that a shovel moves deep into the profile with ease. But being able to describe and define soil health matters. If we want to affect public policy, be able to calculate the economic benefits, and be able to ultimately increase the adoption of management practices that are going to enhance soil health, we need to be able to describe what soil health is and how we know when we've made progress. The Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations uses the definition put forth by Pankhurst in 1997. Soil health is the continued capacity of the soil to function as a vital living system within ecosystem and land use boundaries to sustain biological productivity, promote the quality of air and water environments, and sustain plant, animal, and human health. There have been many permutations and iterations of this definition, but at the heart is always the ability of the soil to function to its capability. The beauty of this definition is that it gives us the framework to assess soil health right there in the first line, the continued capacity to function. Function is an action. Function is a service. Function is getting a job done. And that's what soil does. Soil serves as functions. It, there are five main functions we're going to talk about. Soil decomposes and recycles organic matter. It infiltrates, filters, and stores water. It is a modifier of the atmosphere, a habitat for organisms, and a medium for plant growth. In another setting, we might also talk about some of the other functions of soil. It is the foundation for which we build structures. It is part of our cultural heritage, and it is a history keeper. But today, we're going to focus on the functions that sustain biological productivity and the health of our Earth. The soil is a living, breathing base of our terrestrial ecosystem. And just like a human, it can vary in its functional efficacy. That means that we can measure the health of a soil system by measuring how well it's performing each of the functions that we need in order to maintain the health of our planet. If the first line gives us this framework, the next line gives us the roadmap. What do we need in order to have a healthy system? We need a vital living system. We are part of that ecosystem. We are part of this ecosystem just like the plants that are rooted in the ground, that are feeding the grazers, that are feeding the predators, the earthworms, the insects, and the multitude of microbes that are living underground. The more we come to learn about the world around us, the more we understand this immense role that the microbes are playing in controlling everything from our bodies to the air, the water, the nutrient cycles, and every ecosystem on Earth. In an acre of soil, there can be 10,000 pounds of microbial biomass. If that number doesn't blow your mind, think about how small one of these organisms is. Take one of your hairs and a very small razor and slice it lengthwise 50 times. That's the size of an average soil bacteria. In just one thimble of soil, there can be a billion of these soil bacteria and miles of fungal hyphae. They're connecting plant roots and mineral and water and nutrients, making this whole world under our feet. And these microbes are the unseen heroes of our story. They are the ones performing these functions. The next bit of the definition is a bit of a caveat, because if we've learned one thing in soil, it's that it depends. What should I grow here? How much carbon can this soil store? What are the right management practices for this given place? The answer to all of these questions depend on the soil that was developed in place. There are intrinsic characteristics the texture, parent material, slope of the landscape, and depth to bedrock that limit the capacity of these soils to function. 
There are also climactic controls. The moisture and temperature dynamics of a place influence the activity level of every organism in the system. And all of these variables interact to make a really variable system. That means that if we are going to have a soil index, a soil health measurement system, we need to be able to account for these intrinsic variables so that we can actually measure the dynamic characteristics that we impact through our management. To frame our story of these soil functions, I want to start by considering soil as a habitat. What's needed for any habitat to be productive? These organisms are going to need food, water, air, and shelter. If you think back to the functions that we talked about, they recycle nutrients, store and filter water, modify the atmosphere, and are a plant medium. So all of the things that are the functions that we need to get out of the soil are the same things that are needed in a habitat. So how do all of these come together into the soil? Well, it all starts with carbon. In order for a molecule to be organic, in order for it to be living or to have ever lived, it contains carbon. About 50% of organic matter is carbon, and carbon is absolutely pivotal in every aspect of the soil habitat. There are multitudes of microbes that are acting under the soil, and the vast majority of them are heterotrophic. That means that they need carbon, they need to consume carbon for their food and energy. Without that carbon, they don't have the energy or the building blocks to reproduce or build habitats or to cycle nutrients. Imagine for just a second what would happen if all of the soil organisms stopped taking dead organic matter, turning it into nutrients, and creating new life. There would be piles of bodies all over the earth, and life as we know it would stop. But the circle of life continues, and these carbon-bound molecules are cleaved off into smaller and smaller constituent parts until eventually these nutrients are small enough that the plants can get at them. And in this way, our circle of life cycles through all of the trophic cascades of organisms, always ending up in the soil and always cycling through the microbial communities. Sometimes it's hard to think about the scale that we are talking about. But I had an aha moment when I was in Puerto Rico. I was walking through this cave right here on the top screen, and I pictured myself as a microbe. I was moving through these pore spaces and looking at these organisms that are glued to these uh, mineral walls. And I felt like, this, this is what it's like. This is the scale that we're talking about. Because these microbes, they exude materials out of their body, polymers. They're proteins, carbohydrates, nucleic acids, and lipids. And this is what they build as a matrix for them to live in. It creates this perfect system where they can survive. These extracellular polymeric substances join together to create biofilms to create this living habitat. If this habitat right here is a, is a biofilm on the outside of this cave wall. I like to think about what is going on in that habitat. And I often consider it as something similar to a self-sufficient town, like we have here in this picture. What is needed in that self-sufficient town for it to keep moving? What kind of buildings, what infrastructure, what factories are needed? What are the jobs of the organisms living there? This main road where you see the lights, that might be a root hair where products are moving up and down, and the organisms have built their homes and their businesses right there along that main thoroughfare. Maybe there's a wastewater treatment facility and a food production facility. Maybe there's an energy generating uh, power plant and maybe even some open spaces. This is that self-sufficient town that we use as this idea of what's going on in a biofilm this whole idea that maybe our entire universe is just the speck of a giant's eye, except we are actually those giants, and their whole universe is stuck under our fingernail. So when we think about the biofilm as a self-sufficient town, we can think about a soil aggregate as their entire world. 
this small town is glued to one mineral and glued to another mineral, and these conglomerations of sand, silt, and clay-sized particles, along with organic matter, are held together with chemical attractions, roots, fungal hyphae, and these microbial exudates, gluing these together in this beautiful cooperation to build these aggregates. We talked about how a habitat might be able to um, provide food and water. These aggregates, when these microbes get together and they build these aggregates, they create large pore spaces, and that allows for the rapid infiltration of water. When they glue them together, there also are some particles that are held very close together, allowing them to store water. The organic matter and exudates themselves can hold up to 500 times their own weight in water, further increasing their ability to hold and store that water. So in this way, this built habitat that the microbes have created allows them to store, filter, and deliver water to the plants. I've talked a lot about these uh, exudates like glue, sticking things together. You might also think of them kind of like snot. They can be sticky and slimy and even stretchy, and under the right environmental conditions, they can get dried out and crusty. But this physical consistency matters when we're talking about nutrient cycling. Microbes rely on enzymes that they exude out of their body to break down the organic matter in the system. They spend a lot of energy to make these enzymes, and so when they exude them, they go out into this extracellular polymeric substance and they get stuck. Then when organic matter comes by, it also is going to get stuck in this snot-like substance. And then the enzymes are right there next to the organic matter, and the microbes are right there too so that they can pick up those nutrients and pass along the genetic information to their, their offspring and leave something over for the plants to take it up. So in this way, this built habitat, this extracellular matrix, can also serve as a factory for recycling organic materials. This function is intimately tied to the next, which is the atmospheric modification. When an organism takes in carbon, when a microbe takes in and eats carbon, the major metabolic waste product is carbon dioxide. When there's a lot of oxygen available to those microbes, they can process that organic matter at a pretty rapid rate. When a microbe needs to make a new cell, that new cell is going to contain, on average, somewhere between 10 carbons for every one nitrogen atom. And that means that when we have been feeding the microbes this diet that's really high in nitrogen and constantly giving them new and fresh oxygen, they can cycle these nutrients at a really rapid rate. And so what they've been doing is mining all of the carbon in the soil and using up as much as they possibly can. It's been estimated that about 50% of the carbon that is in our agricultural systems has been lost to the atmosphere. This is where we have this great hope, this hope for an environmental change. We have the ability to start taking soil management from a net emitter of carbon and moving it towards a system to store carbon. When we change our focus to feeding the microbial community by adding organic matter, using cover crops, increasing diversity, and reducing tillage, we can actually have an impact on the atmosphere by taking that carbon and putting it back down into the soil. So we've talked about all of these things as part of our habitat. But the habitat, a diverse habitat, in and of itself has value. Most organisms cannot be grown in isolation. They need each other to make these biofilms so that they can each do their little part of the job. They need the carbon exuded from the plant roots to give them their nutrients. They need the cover to maintain their temperature and moisture, and they need this mix of predator and prey to keep their populations in check. This diverse habitat is where each of these single organisms that only has the genetic potential to do a tiny bit of the job can all get together to form this complex system in the soil. It is the diversity of this habitat that provides the system strength, resilience, and the ability to adapt to change. The last function that we're going to talk about is soil as a medium for growing plants. 
I like to think about the soil rhizosphere, which is the area right around the plant root as the hottest bar in town. This is the place where all of the organisms get together to talk about their triumphs and tribulations, to eat a big juicy burger, to drink a libation, and maybe exchange some genetic information. <laughs> it is in the soil that these plants get their nutrients, their water, where they can discuss fighting disease, and where they put their roots down deep. They take the carbon from the atmosphere and put those nutrients into the soil, thereby feeding the microorganisms as well as the organisms that are eating the plants above them. In this way, plants are this great connector between the underground community and the above ground communities, all interacting and all working in this soil system. In a natural ecosystem, organisms live and die and are cycled through trophic cascades with each individual doing its little part. In the post-World War II agroecosystem, we have come to rely on the wonders of chemistry to fight disease and to deliver nutrients directly to plants. We've de we rely on the power of fossil fuels to combat our weeds and to prepare a seed bed. We've thought that we had the power to control and deliver exactly what the plants need and bypass the messy natural systems. These methods have resulted in great productivity, but it's come at a cost. We have been starving the soil of the carbon that it needs to perform all of these beneficial functions. Without this carbon, we can't build these aggregates, which has caused increased soil erosion, decreased water holding capacity, decreased nutrient cycling rates, an imbalance of organisms, net loss of carbon to the system, and plants that are reliant on costly inputs. But there's hope. More and more producers are starting to rely on the principles of soil health. They want to be allies in combating our environmental challenges. They want generations of farmers to be able to stay on that land and be productive. They want to be able to reduce their inputs and maintain their economic sustainability. They're finding that this is all possible when they focus on feeding and caring for the microbial community so that they can restore the vitality and the capacity of the soil to function as a vital living system. Please join us in this global imperative. <laughs>